Happy Friday, and welcome back to Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Sometimes we have cases that look like they're solved, but something breaks. New information comes forward, or a new technology is used that highlights a new truth. A truth that maybe the person in custody isn't the right suspect at all. How do you bring awareness back to a case that the public has put to rest in their minds? How do you help numerous families deal with the loss of their loved ones and the loss of justice? What if it was indeed a wrongful conviction and they learned that the feeling of justice they had previously was a false pacification all along? I was contacted by someone that is still looking for justice in today's case, a friend of one of the victims. She wrote to me, quote, Susie was like my little sister. We were inseparable as kids. We shared everything. We remained close until the day some monster took her away from me. It's been years, but it still hurts to this day. Someone out there, somewhere, knows who ended their lives. Three people's lives were taken and countless others shook to the core. She's talking about Susan Renee Osborne, her boyfriend, Jason Roger Kinzer, and their friend, Celesta Joy Graves. It was fall of 1998 in Dallas. And when you hear the name Dallas, you might think of a city in Texas or a dramatic television show. But in the U.S. state of Oregon, they have a Dallas of their own. Located 15 miles west of Salem, Dallas, Oregon is the county seat of Polk County and was named after former Vice President George Mifflin Dallas. With a current population of just under 17,000 people, back in the 1990s, it was less than 10,000. While the elevation is only 325 feet above sea level, there's plenty of rural land featuring lush foliage and beautiful hills, but one in particular has an ominous name. After several tragic murders there, NBC Dateline would appropriately coin it Murder Mountain. 26-year-old Susan had recently moved into a new rental home with her boyfriend, Jason. The two had met back in high school when they attended Clover Park High in Washington State. Several years later, they made the move to Oregon. The grayish mobile home they moved into sat on a 30-acre isolated hillside property sitting amongst wineries and Christmas tree farms, their home complete with a basketball hoop at the end of a long gravel lane just off of Orchard Heights Road. It wasn't an easy time for the couple. They had recently both lost their jobs, but found a deal on the 1968 trailer and beat out 300 other people who responded to the same newspaper ad. They could live there rent-free if they agreed to work as caregivers for their landlord, helping to keep up the property and helping her as needed. Their landlord lived in a home just up the hill, right above the trailer. They had only been living there for a few weeks when, on November 23rd, the brutal act would occur. The Associated Press would report that three bodies were found at the mobile home. Jason Kinzer's body was found inside the trailer, in the kitchen area. He had been shot in the back of the head. Susan Osborne's body had been found under the trailer with the body of a friend of theirs, 24-year-old Celesta Joy Graves. Celesta was also a mother to a three-year-old boy. It appears the two were trying to hide and had been found by the killer. Both ladies had also been shot and shell casings were found near all of the bodies. District Attorney Fred Avera would tell the press that one of the theories is that this could have been related to drugs. Quote, at least a couple of the people have drug arrests. It's one possible scenario. We're not looking at this as a random act. It's likely that D.A. Avera was commenting on charges from the previous month. Jason and Celesta were arrested for possession of methamphetamine of more than an ounce. Jason had entered a plea of not guilty, and Celesta had actually just been released a day before the killing. Susan was there when they were both arrested, but she wasn't charged with anything. Later reports would detail that Jason was also convicted in Washington back in 1994 and 1995 for possession of drugs with intent to deliver. This would wind up being the first triple homicide in Polk County ever. 
Law enforcement moved quickly. As some news sources were just reporting on the discovery of the bodies, others were already on to the second article that a suspect was being held in custody. Only one day after the murders were discovered, the Statesman Journal reported that a 32-year-old Northeast Salem man was in custody after being tailed driving to his home. He was arrested at 8.15 p.m. and charged with three counts of aggravated murder. That man was Philip Scott Cannon. D.A. Avera was clear on a few facts about the case. Quote, at this time, we anticipate no further arrests. We're working on the assumption this is a traditional murder where somebody killed somebody because they didn't like them. He also noted that the house didn't appear to be ransacked. No weapons were found on the premises. They did find footprints in the mud around the bodies of Susan and Celesta and reportedly six fingerprints at the crime scene. Was only one of the victims the intended target and the others just had to be silenced? Cannon was arraigned the following day, saying little in court except that he couldn't afford an attorney. The court assigned him one. The judge read out each of the charges, three counts of aggravated murder, plus a charge of being a felon in possession of a firearm. If convicted, he could face life in prison, possibly even the death penalty. He did have previous convictions for unlawful possession of a weapon, marijuana possession, and forgery. Not exactly a violent offender. Cannon considered himself a recreational drug user. How did Cannon get on law enforcement's radar? It would be reported that investigators zeroed in on Cannon when they learned that he was familiar with the victims. Susan and Jason were known to visit Cannon's home regularly. One neighbor estimates that they would get together every other day for a barbecue or just hanging out in the garage talking into the night. However, that obviously wouldn't be enough. Investigators also learned that Cannon was scheduled to be on the property that same day. He was supposed to bid on a plumbing job as he was known as a jack of all trades and did handyman work in the area. Cannon did some work previously for his girlfriend's employer who told the press Cannon was a competent handyman and, quote, I find him to be a hell of a nice guy. I find it hard to believe he could have done anything he's been charged with. Autopsy information would finally be released that also raises an interesting question about who the intended target actually was. Both Susan and Jason were shot in the head, one bullet each. Celesta was shot in the head multiple times. Soon, Cannon's case was brought to a grand jury who wound up indicting him. He pled innocent to the charges, but was now facing the possibility of the death penalty. As the families waited for the trial date, they would face yet another hardship. The personal property belonging to Susan and Jason was still locked up in the trailer. Clothes, photographs, computers, their families wanted it all back, but someone was stopping them. Bimla Boyd was the landlord that the couple were supposed to be taken care of, and she claimed that in the weeks that the couple lived in the trailer, they had wrecked the pipes, blew the furnace, and tore up the walls, causing $7,000 in damage, and she wanted someone to pay for it. Polk County records showed that the entire trailer was only worth about $2,510. Also still there was Celeste's car. Bimla Boyd told the press that the families agreed to pay for the damage, then changed their minds. She also wanted them to sign a waiver, absolving her of any responsibility if they contracted a disease from the dried blood of their murdered children. Quote, the blood has to be cleaned up. For my sake, your sake, nobody can go in there. It's right in the entryway. You can't escape it. The families told the press that they were considering suing for the property and that she's flipping the story around. They initially offered the waiver, but Bimla is insisting on the money for repairs. When asked what she will do if she gains ownership of the property in the trailer, Bimla said, I always made it clear that I don't want anything. Why would I? What do their clothes and pictures have anything to do with me? A month later, the families agreed to give Bimla Boyd $500 and sign a waiver, and she allowed them to come get their loved one's belongings. Jason's father, Glenn Betts, was one of the first to enter the trailer. He covered the blood with plastic and newspapers before bringing Jason's mother in. Quote, the most horrible part for me was my son bled to death on the floor, 
and it was all there. It was horrific. It was like getting the bad news all over again. They did find a photo album filled with pictures of Susan and Jason. It would take over a year, but the trial for Philip Cannon would start in January of 2000. The defense attorneys said in their opening statements that by the end of the trial, there will be three people that the evidence points to more strongly than Philip Cannon. The trial was scheduled for three weeks and could have up to 100 witnesses called to the stand. The public learned that the weapon used was a 22 caliber pistol and the murders took place in the span of about 30 minutes, starting somewhere around 3.28 p.m. Bim Boyd is the person that found Jason's body and called 911 to report the murder. That call happened at 3.57 p.m. Cannon was thought to be on the property prior to that. However, his attorneys point out that he's home by 4.02, and it's a 20-minute drive from the property. The prosecution was looking to prove that he was on the property precisely in that 30-minute window and that the trace amounts of silver and copper in the shell casings is a match to casings found in Cannon's garage. The state brought up expert Michael Conradi, who analyzes rocks and metals using a nuclear reactor at Oregon State University. He had previously worked on at least 30 forensic cases. He stated that each batch of bullets would have a unique combination. And of the 17 bullets taken from Cannon's garage, 13 of them matched one of the shell casings from the scene. If that wasn't a strong enough match, Conradi also performed bullet lead analysis, stating that the lead in the slugs found in Cannon's garage were chemically indistinguishable from the lead slugs found in the victims. The odds of that match were reportedly 1 in 64 million. Bim Boyd would also take the stand, telling the court that a dog had damaged a pipe in the trailer and that three men, including Cannon, were on the property that same day. Apparently, she got a quote from one plumber who would charge $1,000 to fix it. Jason was outraged. He said he would have his friend do it for less, and that person was Cannon. Bimla said that Cannon arrived between 3 and 3.30 p.m., but she wasn't happy with how long it was taking Cannon to quote the job. She drove down her mile-long driveway to get the mail, and on the way back, heavy winds blew over part of a tree, blocking her way back up. Phone records show that she tried to call Jason at 326, but no one answered. She tried Susan's phone and got no answer there as well. Two men reportedly drove up behind her, Jeremy Olson and Larry Weaver. One of them used her phone to call Jason again, and reportedly they got through. He demanded that Jason come and help, but Jason never did. The two men moved the tree and followed Boyd back up to her house, Bim Boyd says that she watched from her window as the two men that helped her left, and then Cannon's maroon van left shortly thereafter. The defense argued that from her vantage point inside the house, there was no way for her to see Cannon leaving. At about 3.45, she saw smoke coming from the trailer. She ran into the trailer and put out a small fire that she said seemed to be deliberately set. She said that Jason's pit bull led her to Jason who was clinging to life in a pool of his own blood. She called 911 at 357. The trial would continue for seven weeks without a gun or much physical evidence to tie Cannon to the crime. And by late February, it was ready to conclude. The case was resting on a timeline, about 50 witnesses and of course the expert that matched the bullet casings and the lead analysis. Despite the gun never being found, a friend of Cannon's said that he did see Cannon with the same kind of gun weeks before the shooting, and why would Cannon have matching bullets in his garage if he didn't have a 22? There is also evidence that Cannon had created multiple homemade silencers in his garage before the murder. Would all this be enough to move the jury to a conclusion beyond a reasonable doubt, and more importantly, would a guilty verdict be correct? Ultimately, the prosecution never nailed down a particular motive, just the vague connectivity of people connected through drugs. And Cannon's story from the beginning was that he saw a well-dressed Hispanic man sitting in Jason's home that afternoon. The prosecution has the timeline leaving Cannon a 15-minute window to be the murderer, while the defense has a 22-minute window that could have been when someone else did this. 
After about a day of deliberating, the jury came back with a verdict, guilty on all counts. During the sentencing phase, his parents, girlfriend, and 10-year-old son all spoke on his behalf. Cannon also has another son that was actually born while he was in jail. Quote, I will never believe he's guilty of these crimes, said his live-in girlfriend of 12 years. His parents begged the court to spare his life. The prosecutors were still talking about the death penalty, while the minimum he could have received would be a 30-year sentence. Ultimately, the jury recommended life in prison with no chance of parole, and it was granted by the judge. Jason's father was in court wearing three pins shaped like angels on his shirt. Quote, we did not want him to get the death penalty. We didn't want his parents to go through what we did. What they did want was justice. But this is not the end of the story, not by a long shot. As Cannon began serving his life sentence in the Oregon State Penitentiary, another person we've spoken about previously would come back into the fold in an unbelievable way. It was late September of 2002, and a now 45-year-old Bimla Boyd had divorced her husband Charles the previous year after a marriage of nearly 20 years. She was living with their two teenage children in the same home. News reports detailed that Bimla Boyd had been taken into custody on suspicion of murder. All the early reports noted was that she had shot someone in the throat using a gun and the person died at the scene. It was someone that didn't live in the home and the victim was not related to the family. It was 54-year-old Robert Daniel Spencer. He and a roommate were living in the same trailer where the brutal murders took place and he was working there as a property caretaker the same job that Jason and Susan had taken on. Spencer would feed chickens and goats, cut trees and clear brush, fix fences, as well as take Bimla to medical appointments, take her children to the school bus stop every morning, and even helped Bimla shower. It's said that this developed into more than just a business relationship with the two taking some trips together. Robert Daniel Spencer was shot at close range with a rifle, reportedly during a verbal disagreement with Bimla in her home. Murder Mountain had now claimed a fourth victim, and there was possibly a fifth. Bimla's former husband, Charles, also died in her home three months after their divorce, a divorce that's thought by some to be legal protection for fraudulent claims about the couple being separated years before, reporting that they were living apart but actually still living together. This allowed them to claim thousands of dollars from the West Valley Housing Authority. The cause of his death was unknown. However, the medical examiner's report stated it was most likely a combination of heart issues, obesity, and prescription drugs. Most likely. The man was only 44 years old, a mail carrier for the post office that stood at six foot one and weighed around 220 pounds. The family of Charles Boyd, as well as Bimla's oldest son, James, who came from a previous marriage, asked for a new investigation into Charles's death, which was originally looked at as a possible homicide, but not enough evidence was found to support it. Bimla told investigators that Charles had taken his own life with prescription drugs, but the amounts found in his body were non-lethal. The family stated that Bimla stayed a controlling force in his life even after their divorce. He kept making the mortgage payments, and she remained the beneficiary on his life insurance, which was worth at least $400,000. With the supposed murderer of the first three victims sitting behind bars, a big question arose in the minds of the public. Did they get the wrong person? Within a few days, Philip Scott Cannon would comment, saying, She was basically the main witness against me. I think it probably would raise questions about her credibility. I unequivocally say that I didn't do it. She established a timeline on when I was allegedly there. This whole case hinges on the timeline. Media outlets would also hear how Bimla was a reluctant witness and had even spoken to a lawyer about leaving the country when Cannon's trial was going on. News reporters would also look into her past, uncovering many who said that she left a trail of deception, fraud, and fractured relationships. They also detailed that Murder Mountain may have claimed two more lives, 
An elderly man and an elderly woman had also lived with Bimla there in the past few years, and they passed away there as well. However, their deaths are believed to be from natural causes. While some friends call her, quote, a modern woman who knows what she wants and doesn't want, her own son James says she means to do well, but she's her own worst enemy. She can only keep that up for so long before she succumbs to her selfish nature. She goes through friends like some people drink coffee in the morning. She's a very intense person. James would actually wind up stepping up in a very big way, moving his siblings into his own home. He told the press, Though the circumstances are certainly tragic, both my wife and I are ecstatic that the kids can come live with us and finally lead somewhat normal lives. Bimla Boyd initially claimed that she was innocent, but at trial, she would plead no contest to charges of manslaughter, saying that she found her underage daughter in a compromising position with Spencer in his trailer. Bimla Boyd served almost seven years in prison and was released May 28, 2009, the year of yet another significant development. In August, the front page of the Statesman Journal showed a picture of Philip Scott Cannon in court with the headline, Killer to Get New Trial. After 10 years of being jailed, the Oregon Department of Justice agreed to a new trial after Cannon's legal team raised doubts about the validity of key evidence, particularly that bullet lead analysis, which by 2009, as a forensic tool, had been discredited in a report by the National Academy of Sciences. It was abandoned by the FBI in 2005 and being commonly referred to as junk science by many. Of course, there was also the testimony of Bimla Boyd. Cannon told the press, new witnesses have come forward with information that not only disputes much of her trial testimony, but also paints a disturbing picture as to her true nature a nature contrary to what she portrayed to the jury. In preparing for the retrial, a few weeks later, a judge would overturn the convictions against Cannon and his attorney prepped for a meeting with prosecutors to try to convince them not to retry the case against Cannon. He wouldn't have to make much of an argument. In yet another unbelievable turn with this case, prosecutors couldn't find key evidence from the original trial, essentially all the exhibits that were presented. A special investigator named Dennis Carson was given the task of trying to locate the evidence. He interviewed the former district attorney, who told him that he may have ordered to purge the case file back in 2005, destroying all the key evidence. However, Carson's report also mentions a file clerk who says the exhibits were preserved and she gave them to an office manager in the DA's office. Effectively, this takes the entire investigation into the murders of Jason, Susan, and Celesta back to square one. How do you redo an investigation 10 years after the fact with key evidence destroyed or missing? Jason's father, Glenn Betts, noted that the family was struggling with learning of Cannon's release and that he would have liked something more substantial than destroyed evidence and invalidated forensics resulting in that. However, he also told the press, if he's not the one that did it, I'd like to have the one that did it be found and put in jail. He would also say that Bimla Boyd's testimony is what clinched it for him in his mind. Cannon was released by December and quickly in the arms of his son and his father. He said he planned on going back to school to study psychology and that he wanted to work to pay back the over $300,000 in legal fees to his family. The media's viewpoint on Cannon would quickly change also, from killer to wrongfully convicted, with opinion pieces pontificating on the pitfalls of justice and risk of innocent people being put behind bars. Is that really what happened here? Or was a murderer released due to bad records keeping? Cannon was hearing this directly after his release. Quote, I've been getting a bunch of calls from people going on about how I was released on a technicality, the reality is the court determined that their key evidence was no good. Celesta Graves' sister, Jennifer Murdoch, would tell the press, Polk County totally screwed this thing up. It's basically a bunch of crap that the families have to go through all this again. As far as I'm concerned, he's as guilty today as he was back then. 
it sickens me to know that he gets to live his life. As an opinion piece in the Statesman Journal points out, if Cannon is innocent, as he says, the lost evidence will always leave lingering questions. Cannon, however, seems to have no question in his mind. He decided to sue the state and the county for the wrongful conviction to the tune of $21.5 million. In October of 2011, there is another unbelievable development. Four boxes of the lost murder evidence is found in the evidence room of the Oregon Department of Justice. Cannon would say, I'm a little miffed about it, but at the same time, I welcome a new trial because that's the only way to set the record straight. It seems that the special investigator asked then Assistant Attorney General Susan Gerber for help finding the boxes. They were later found in a file cabinet 10 feet from her office by a clerk. The four boxes contained bullets, shell casings, crime scene photos, and more. Gerber said, there is no way in hell I would lie or hide evidence in a case. With the evidence found, there should be a possibility of new charges, but would they be for Philip Scott Cannon or Bimla Boyd? On top of everything else we've discussed here today, Datelight pointed out that Bimla Boyd claimed Jason was gasping for air when she found him, but the medical examiner said that he likely only lived for one minute after he was shot. So if she did witness that, it's likely that she witnessed the shooting. As a matter of fact, there's other information floating around out there. A letter, once again brought up by Dateline, that's been confirmed to be in her handwriting, where she says she witnessed the murder of three people. Other information that I found online points to the possibility that Bimla might have been a drug user herself, that there might have been people that were giving her drugs. Is it possible that she did witness this murder, but she knew the people that committed it? and they just kept her under control. I don't know. It seems strange to me that they would go as far as killing, it seems like killing everyone at the scene so that there's no witnesses, but then leave her for some reason. I'm, I'm really not sure, but there is all kinds of different points of information out there that you could easily string together to make it look like she was at least a witness of it. But of course, with the other things we're talking about here, it seems like there's a possibility she might be the suspect herself, and she's not the only one. The thing is, at this point, it appears that there have been no further charges in relation to these terrible murders filed. Decades later, we do know that there were several pieces of evidence that may have been helpful. I don't know what happened with those. I haven't heard any additional analysis on the footprints in the mud that were found, which apparently it was a rainy night or a rainy day when they went out there uh, to the scene right after the, the discovery. I don't know if they got pictures of those footprints, but I would think some type of footprint analysis would be really helpful in this. We know that there was six fingerprints taken from the scene. Once again, no analysis on that. Of advancements in DNA testing. I don't know if they collected things from the scene that could be DNA tested. Obviously shell casings, usually a good thing for DNA testing. It's been decades, like there's plenty of new technologies that could be helpful with that. But then we've got this other thing, even though the evidence box has been found, um, in general, I'm hearing that the evidence at this scene was not handled great to start with. The defense complained that some evidence was collected in coffee cans, that one officer decided to take a shell casing back to the office. He just put it in his pocket a red lighter that was found at the scene uh, disappeared and then someone found it on the floor of the sheriff's station. So we've kind of got ev evidence handling issues all around this case. And that's before we get to the lost boxes. With those lost boxes, is that evidence even still reliable? You had it lost for six years where people didn't know where it actually was. Now, I'm sure that this was a, a building that's locked down. Uh, I don't know if the file cabinet's locked down. You don't know if employees could have been handling it. Uh, in terms of DNA testing that evidence, I, I don't think that there's probably a very strong possibility with some of that because of that mysterious gap in time where people didn't know where it was. So that might be part of the stopgap that we're seeing with this case in terms of new charges being filed. 
Was this a case of making the evidence disappear to avoid embarrassment and then making it reappear to save the state money? Um, I don't know. The timing on it is really strange to me that, you know, basically he gets a new trial. Oh, they don't have the evidence. We can't prosecute this new trial. He decides he's going to sue them. Oh, wait. Yeah, we do have the evidence. And his lawsuit stuff kind of gets stopped up with some technicalities along the way. Um, we've got this one person that's saying, hey, I, I wouldn't hide evidence. Um, she no longer works in that role. And there are other people that were part of that report that said, yeah, no, I remember reviewing the evidence in her office. I don't know. It's really strange. Oregon Live reports, quote, in a subsequent civil lawsuit filed in 2010, Cannon claimed that state lawyers stalled the case for years, trying, among other things, to convince Cannon to give up his right to seek monetary damages in the event that he was released. So it does seem like there might be something. I mean, why are they trying to get that out of him, especially after he has a life conviction? I have no idea. For the next five and one half years, former Assistant Attorney General Susan Gerber knowingly delayed the judicial process, engaging in delay tactics, numerous postponements, and failing to disclose the loss and or destruction of evidence Cannon claimed in his lawsuit. So it's definitely something that him and his legal team were considering. But are there any other suspects outside of Philip and Bimla? Yes. Dateline reported that two men were actually making a drug delivery to Jason. Cannon says that they were there. They say Cannon stopped them at the road and wouldn't let them up to the trailer. So we do have other men that are part of this. Susan actually reportedly, based on Cannon's story, Susan told Cannon to leave when he heard an argument that was going on in the trailer he thought it was between Jason and one other man. It was escalating. They were getting louder and louder. And he thinks that Susan actually saved his life by saying, yeah, you should probably get out of here. Then we also have the person described as a Hispanic looking man that was seen by Cannon reportedly in the trailer. And there's some information that says that guy might actually exist. A photo lineup was found in the police files, and when a former reporter turned private investigator showed it to Cannon, he saw the lineup and he immediately pointed out the man that he saw back at the trailer. This man is named Thomas McMahon. He is not indeed Hispanic, but he does have dark features. McMahon was also involved in drugs and was known to associate with Jason. As a matter of fact, they were arrested together in those drug charges that we mentioned previously. I also saw a statement from a girlfriend of McMahon's, and she said that he essentially confessed to her that he was at the scene and he watched the girls scrambling under the trailer and he saw the fear in their eyes as they were shot. She also claimed that he told her about the murders before they were being publicly reported and that he acted very bizarre and strange around all of this. He also accused her of uh, potentially being a snitch because she didn't like doing drugs and forced her to do drugs. And that kind of brings me to this one question that has nagged me through this whole thing. That question is about Celeste's murder. It seems like with her murder, there's something different. Why is everyone else shot execution style, single shot to the back of the head, except Celesta? She receives multiple gunshot wounds. Was she possibly involved with Cannon? I did find one reference in one very old article that said that there might have been some romantic involvement between the two. That was the only place I'd seen it. Everything else pretty much reported that Cannon had his long-term girlfriend of 12 years who he referred to as his common-law wife, and they had children together. So I don't know that there was really any romantic thing there, but I did see it reported in one place. Was Bimla upset about Celesta just being on the property? Bimla seems to be, by everything I'm seeing, a bit of a control freak. All of a sudden, there's this third person. She's not one of the tenants. She's not someone that helps Bimla with keeping up the property or doing her personal things. Could Bimla have been upset at this person that kept showing up on the property? I, I don't think we can necessarily rule that out. Or was Thomas McMahon somehow wrapped up in this? Did he think that maybe Celesta was a snitch of some kind? 
I mean, she had only been released from police custody literally the day before this happened. Did he think that she was going to have some information or flip on them and make the charges against him worse? I don't know. But ultimately, Thomas McMahon was never pursued as a murder suspect, according to information from Dateline NBC. But someone would face new charges, and I bet you already know who I'm going to say. Bimla Boyd would face some new charges and appear in papers again in 2012, though not on a giant headline and not directly related to the murders. Apparently, living in Eugene, Oregon at the time, she worked as a caregiver for an elderly man. Kind of interesting how her universe just seemed to flip around with that role, isn't it? So she apparently got this job pretty close to the time when she was released from prison for the manslaughter charge. In that four-year span, she stole $26,000 from this elderly man, somehow got him to sign over his car to her and his home to her. And she did all this while conducting food stamp and welfare fraud. And she was still on parole for the death of Robert Daniel Spencer. She would face 65 charges in all. Most importantly, in the elderly man's petition for a protective order against Bimla Boyd, he alleged that state protective service workers took him to a hospital fearing that he may have been poisoned. Eugene PD also suspected she was using online dating profiles, working on finding her next victim. Bimla was again convicted on numerous counts and would face four more years behind bars. Now in his 50s, Philip Scott Cannon got back to work doing carpentry and welding. He also did go back to college and wound up earning a degree. As for his lawsuit, from what I could see, it's off, it's on, it's off, it's on. As of 2017, it was being reviewed by a federal appeals court, but I can't find any updates about it after that. So where is the justice for Susan Renee Osborne, Jason Roger Kinzer, Celeste Joy Graves, and their friends and family? Later this month will be 24 years since the brutal murders. And in the eyes of the public, it looks like there is no movement on this case at all. Some sources say that the district attorney's office has only ever considered Cannon the plausible suspect. Susan, Jason, and Celesta are still missed. They're still loved. And they have a friend reaching out to a community on YouTube asking for help. If you have friends or family in Oregon, please share this video with them and let's see if someone out there has the missing piece that can bring answers to these families. If you're that person, please, Find it in your heart to use the contact information that we have in the description box below. A big thank you to the many people that support our work. We always run these episodes with limited commercial interruptions, and we just can't do that without support. Thank you to new patron Kira McQueen and everyone else that supports our work. If you'd like to help, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Ann Peters recently did. Have a nice weekend, and please join us again on Monday for a brand new episode of Case Cracked right here on the Lord and Rich channel.